Will the Denver Broncos enter an AFC West divisional showdown on Sunday Night Football this weekend against the Kansas City Chiefs with a clean bill of health? We go through the latest injury report. Which players could be returning for the Broncos? Which players are expected to sit out a little bit longer? Plus, we answer Broncos Country's questions in a mailbag episode, Locked on Broncos. You are Locked on Broncos, your daily Denver Broncos podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network. Your team, every day. What's up, Broncos country? Welcome back into a brand new episode of Lockdown Broncos, your daily Denver Broncos podcast here on the Lockdown NFL Network, your team. Every day, the Broncos hoping for a clean bill of health against the Kansas City Chiefs this Sunday. To break down the action, I'm Cody Rourke, host of Lockdown Broncos, joined alongside by co-host Sarah Benger from the South Stands to the End Zone. Both of us, we have you covered with all the latest news every single day on the Denver Broncos. We also cover the Broncos for the Lockdown Network and Nine News. Sarah, my friend, it's great to see you. Just want to give Broncos country a quick shout out. Thank you for making Lockdown Broncos your first listen of the day every single day when you get ready to go to work, on your way home from work. Lockdown Broncos, thank you for making it your first listen of the day. How you doing, my friend? I'm doing great. And, and yeah, I'm with you, Cody. You got some great comments on the YouTube video from yesterday's episode of people just expressing their appreciation for us, you know, interacting and things like that. And so kudos to you for always doing a great job of that. I always love getting to, you know, even when it was when I wasn't on the show with you, Cody, I always love chatting with you on YouTube and Twitter and all that. So uh, shout out to Broncos country for staying engaged throughout the season. And here we are. We got some good times rolling right now. So <laughs> it, it's feeling good in Broncos country going into this primetime matchup. Yeah, absolutely, too. And a lot of excitement. And look, even the national media talking about the Broncos a little bit. Got some love from Good Morning Football from Kyle Brandt. Uh, you know, Peter Schrager, obviously good friend of the show here. Love Peter Schrager, what he's got going on. Obviously, angry runs. We need another Javante Williams scepter honor being taken home this week. Hopefully that's the case. But, you know, Sarah, to start off today's episode of the show, before we get into more interaction with Broncos country, we have a mailbag later on we'll get to. But let's talk about the big topic right now of today's show, and that is whether or not the Broncos will get a clean bill of health in preparation for this Kansas City Chiefs game because, look, this is going to be a tough matchup. The Chiefs, well-rested, and, look, they've been on a roll quietly the last couple of weeks, and their defense has actually played a lot better in the last couple of weeks as well. So this isn't going to be an easy matchup by any means of the imagination for the Broncos, but it depends on which Broncos team shows up, which Chiefs team shows up, and it's nice if you can get a couple guys back. So the Broncos hope to get Garrett Bulls back at left tackle this week as he still has yet to clear COVID protocols there. So as of today, as of Monday when we record this podcast for Tuesday, nothing yet on that side. So he still has to clearly has to post two negative COVID tests in a row in order to come back to the team facility. Facility. The longer that that doesn't happen, the less likely it is for him to play. So hopefully we get some good news in the next day or so. The Broncos don't practice on Tuesdays. They have the day off. They have meetings. But outside of that, they'll be back on the field on Wednesday. So hopefully Garrett Bowles will be back in the facility for that. Your thoughts on that? I mean, what would it be like for the Broncos against Kansas City in this game specifically, Sarah, to get a guy like Garrett Bowles back at the left tackle position? Because Calvin Anderson was there. Obviously, he got hurt. He's going to be out for a couple weeks. Could be placed on IR injury, not as serious as initially thought. But, you know, you got him, and then you got Quinn Bailey behind him. I think, Cody, the Broncos need to maybe look into – here we are recording on Monday, like you said, going from Monday into Tuesday. I think they kind of need to be scouring other teams' practice squads, maybe the veteran free agent market, and kind of thinking about some emergency options. I mean, Quinn Bailey, he got a game ball. He did a really good job. This is a critical matchup, though, and so you need to make sure that you don't go into this game with just Quinn Bailey and and another practice squad guy behind him. You know, against the Kansas City Chiefs, who, like you said, they're playing really improved ball defensively since they got Melvin Ingram in that trade from the Steelers which by the way what a stupid trade by the Pittsburgh Steelers I don't know what they were thinking trading to an AFC opponent but at the same time you know it is what it is the reality is the Kansas City Chiefs have won four games and their defense has been a big reason why so I think that definitely that you got to be preparing for any situation including Garrett Bowles not being available obviously you won't have Calvin Anderson so I think you got to go get somebody who's played some games potentially that could slide into that left tackle spot if need be I know the Broncos have you know guys on their team that they believe in but just in case kind of similar to what we've seen defensively Cody with what they did with Avery Williamson coming in kind of being an emergency option for them at the linebacker spot I think they need to do something similar at the offensive tackle position if Bowles you know is even in 
question for this Sunday. Well, and even this Sunday, too, the Broncos could get Bobby Massey back at right tackle. Now, his wife had tweeted on Twitter that she can't wait to see him back next week. So this might be the week we see Bobby Massey return to right tackle. And if he's still hobbled a little bit, I wouldn't expect the Broncos to just deplace Cam Fleming. Look, I think Cam Fleming's done a pretty solid job so far since being inserted into the lineup. It's been nice to see him step in. And look, this is where I think double dipping and having veteran options at each position or trying to double dip at each position as much as possible is great because George Payton has proven depth is so necessary it's so critical and that has been so true for the Broncos this season so Cam Fleming has done exactly what the Broncos need him to do when Bobby Massey was out step up and play well and he's done just that I thought he did really well against Bosa on Sunday in the Broncos 28 to 13 victory against the Los Angeles Chargers but now what about the quarterback position Sarah's there going to be controversy this week I just want to tell Broncos country no there is no quarterback controversy this week Teddy Bridgewater should be good to go Vic Fangio met with the media briefly on Monday and said that Teddy is fine he didn't get any medical update from the Broncos team trainer on that so that's good news he saw Teddy and Teddy said he's good to go he just initially dealt with some sweat in the shin, but you know what he's going to be doing this week, Sarah? He's going to be icing it. He's going to take some ice baths. He's going to be in the hot tub as well, and he's going to get a lot of treatment on his shin. You know, it's a little bit of a bone. It's a tissue thing more so than anything. So as long as he's doing that and going through treatment, he should be good to go Sunday primetime against the Kansas City Chiefs. So that's good there. Uh, and some other good news, Sarah. One guy on the defensive side of the ball will be back. It's Kareem Jackson. Now, here's an interesting thing. I think we got some questions about this, too, in our mailbag. Uh, but I thought Caden Stearns, initially, going back and watching the game broadcast, re-watching the game broadcast, I thought Caden Stearns did a pretty good job. Now, I'm still waiting to get my hands on the all-22 NFL game passes, doing its crazy thing, as always. But Kareem will be back in this week for this game. Eager to see what Vic Fangio does. Obviously, Kareem's been playing fantastic. I don't think that that's going to change anything. He'll get the start, but does it change what they do with Caden Stearns a little bit, or does he go back to that dimebacker role? A lot of questions there. I think that's the smart move, right? And maybe maybe you try Kareem Jackson in there for a handful of plays like we've suggested in the past. I don't think that's the worst idea, Cody. I feel like Caden Stearns has such exceptional athleticism and range on that back end. You think about the Kansas City Chiefs, you immediately think, obviously, about their speed at the skill positions, and they are fast. I mean, and Travis Kelsey, even the older he gets, it seems like the better he gets. Not necessarily faster, but he still plays really fast, and he still seems to find a way to get open almost every play. So when you've got Tyree Kill, Miko Hardman, and then you've got their backup receivers who are all fast, you've got Travis Kelsey, their backs out of the backfield. It wouldn't be the worst idea, in my opinion, to do what we've suggested in the past. Maybe throw Kareem Jackson into that dime backer role keep Caden Stearns on the back end to limit those big plays over the top where the Broncos have been kind of vulnerable this season defensively at times. I know teams have taken shots against them every single week. Sometimes they miss, sometimes they hit. feels like more often than not, they are hitting those deep shots at least a couple of times downfield against the Chargers. That wasn't the case against the Chiefs. We'll have to wait and see, but we know Pat Mahomes is going to be pushing the ball downfield, so I wouldn't hate seeing Caden Stearns play a little bit more deep safety than dime backer this week. Man, there's so many things I'm excited about seeing, Sarah. I'm excited about Baron Brown and Kenny Young against Kelsey and even the Clyde Edwards Elaire out of the backfield. So many matchups that we're going to get to. And plus, we're going to have a crossover episode later on the week with the Locked On Chiefs guys to preview Sunday's big primetime matchup. Uh, there's a couple more injury updates here before we get to our Broncos mailbag, Sarah. Dalton Reisner, day to day with a back injury. Vic Fangio said he should be able to go on Sunday. If not, we'll see Natani Muti more than likely step up there at the left guard position. He did a really good job coming in in relief in that first quarter for him. And the Broncos were able to run the ball effectively, 147 yards on the ground. So I'm not, I'm not worried about that. Shelby Harris still questionable. No update on him just yet. He tweaked his ankle in practice Thursday last week, and that obviously caused him to miss Sunday. So we'll see where he's at. I imagine he'll be... DNP probably on Wednesday, maybe limited on Thursday, and hopefully he could be a full go on Friday to be able to be ready to play on Sunday. So a lot of storylines to follow here in Broncos country. Coming up here in just a moment, we're going to answer your mailbag questions in just a moment. But let me tell you about the sponsor. Today's episode, Lockdown Broncos, it's our good friends over there at Beachbound. In life, we're all bound for different things, and with Beachbound.com vacations, you could be bound for adventure, bound for passion, bound for discovery, or bound for togetherness, bound for immersion, bound for rejuvenation, or you may be bound for encounter the unexpected and personally when I'm at a beach resort I'm bound to end up at the poolside bar or maybe creating my own taco flight and as long as I've got a good view and a good drink in my hand I'll be as happy as can be and with beachbound.com you can find the perfect beach vacation for you no matter what you're looking for what are you bound for visit beachbound.com today
All right, so as we jump into our Broncos country mailbag, we answer your questions that you sent in on Twitter at Cody Work and Fail at Lockdown Broncos at Sarah Bettinger. Just want to give a quick shout out to Broncos country. Thank you so much once again for making Lockdown Broncos your first listen of the day every single day. It's perfect for when you got to get up, you got to drive to work, turn on the Lockdown Broncos podcast, help let Sarah and I get you to work with everything you need to know. What's going on with the Broncos, the team that you were for on Sundays. And also, if you want to watch us, hit the subscribe button on YouTube, turn on notifications so you never miss out on all the action that we have. And if you're watching this video on YouTube right now, hit that like button, help us out with the algorithm. But Sarah, Let's get into our Broncos country map. A lot of great questions from Broncos country following the Broncos 28-13 victory over the Los Angeles Chargers. And let's start one off here with Nezzy1909 on Twitter. He says, with George Payton's rookie class beginning to develop into real cohesive quality group, how do you see some of the veteran contracts being handled in the upcoming offseason? Which positions do you think that the Broncos could most likely see vets getting traded or cut? I'm going to let you answer this one, but I, I do want to point out real quick. I, I George Payton's 10 rookie draft class he had here in 2021, six of them right now are playing significant roles for the Broncos defense. Five of them are starting. And probably the most impactful guy isn't starting, and that's Javante Williams. So read into that what you may, but six out of 10, Sarah, that is great. And I go back to a quote that George Payton had said in the offseason. He said, if you hit on 50, if you hit on half those guys, you're in a really good spot as an organization. So 60%, I'll take that. That's definitely over the 50. And obviously, you look at other guys like Marquis Spencer developing right now on the roster on the back end. Jamar Johnson, another developmental guy. And then you have Kerry Vincent Jr., who's obviously no longer on the football team as he got traded away. So uh, a lot to make of that. But, man, I tell you what, uh, what do you think about this question here from Andrew? I love this question. And I think, you know, roster building, Cody, you know me. This is one of my favorite things in all football. I love the games. I almost, I hate to admit, I love roster building even more than the games, but I kind of do, you know, and this is kind of my thing. So I, I look ahead, you know, at this roster in terms of veteran guys that are on the team. I don't necessarily see any players that scream out to me as potential trade candidates. I do think the Broncos could do, make some interesting compromises with players that they have at the linebacker position and at safety. Obviously, we mentioned Kareem Jackson already with Caden Stearns, and then you touched on Cody Jamar Johnson is developing behind him. Uh, you almost wonder if Caden Stern slides into Kareem Jackson's role from this year, and then Jamar Johnson maybe slides into the role that they carved out for Caden Stearns in 2022. That could be kind of interesting. And then you look at the linebacker position. Obviously, you know, you've got Justin Cernod, you've got Baron Browning, and then you have decisions to make with the veterans on the team with two guys that are on IR, Alexander Johnson, Josie Jewell, and then Kenny Young, who's obviously played really well since coming over in that trade from extend the Los that man, Angeles please. Rams. George Payton, yeah, I'd love it. to see it. I would love to see it. And, and it's easy to forget, too, Josie Jewell was playing really well prior to his injury. So we know that George Payton likes to kind of double dip at these positions. I would love to see him bring back both Kenny Young and Josie Jewell. Not, not that there's anything that I have against Alexander Johnson returning, potentially. Jewell and, and Young are probably the guys that have been the most consistently good out of that group. And I think Alexander Johnson, he's he's you know a little bit older than those two guys as well. So it, it'll be tough decisions to make, but I feel like those two guys, I, I, I feel like those are the veterans that you're looking at potentially. And somebody else asked the same question we got last week too about who could be next to be extended. I feel like those, those linebackers are the ones to look at for that as well as potential you know where do you make those veteran decisions after the season I agree and I think that the Broncos if they were going to extend a guy like Kenny Young it's probably going to happen in season I don't think it's going to happen in the offseason so something to monitor there obviously a great question by Nezzy 1909 the next one comes in from Stephen Kelly and he says do you think if the Broncos rally and make the playoffs that they'll keep Pat Shermer this offseason now it kind of ties in. This is an interesting question because before we actually started recording this, Sarah and I were talking. And look, I, here's the deal. I understand. Look, there's things that Pat Shermer does as an offensive play caller that just doesn't gel. Sometimes it doesn't make sense. And I think those are all very valid. There's moments where he's just been brutal for the Broncos in terms of consistency, play calling, and flow. But also, I, I will have to say, he did a pretty good job against the Chargers, you know, Sarah on Sunday. I thought he had a, he called a really good game and he didn't abandon the run. That was one thing that we had talked about. So, we go back to the Eagles game and we talk about the Broncos offense. Obviously, Sherman was not there. It was Mike Shula calling plays from the sideline. Not a great vantage point. So 
I mean, do they keep Pat Shermer? I personally don't believe that they do just because I think George Payton, where he's going, if he's really intent on bringing in a franchise quarterback, a guy like Russell Wilson or Aaron Rodgers via trade, or if they're going to go out and they're going to draft a guy, one of these guys in this year's NFL draft, sir, I don't think that they're going to roll a Shermer scheme. They want to go with a more modern version of what you see in the NFL offense today and maybe see if they can amplify that with the talent that they have, with the running backs that they have, with the wide receivers that they have, with the line that they have. That's the only thing that makes sense here. I don't see Pat Shermer honestly sticking around, even if he continues to call good games. Yeah, that's tough to see. I think the question could almost be reworded to say, what does that mean about Vic Fangio's future? You know, if the team continues to play well, and we've seen them play well now, not just against bad teams, but against pretty darn good teams. I mean, Dallas yeah. and, and the Chargers are, are both pretty good teams, I would say, in the NFL this year. I mean, a lot of people might question that initially and be like, wow, they're like really good teams. You know, they've been kind of losing to some bad teams or some average teams, but that's kind of so just the entire everybody NFL else. this year. The Bay Buccaneers <laughs> lost to the Washington football team, ladies and gentlemen, that's just right. several weeks ago, so – yeah. That's right. So by yeah, what is that? What is that law that you know the Broncos are then better than the Buccaneers because they beat the Washington football team? So it, it's just funny how the NFL is this year. It's not necessarily topsy turvy. It's just kind of like everybody is right in that middle. So I think that speaks volumes though to the potential of Vic Fangio coming back. We heard George Payton say you know that Vic was a big reason why he chose Denver, and who knows how much of that was really just coach speak or GM speak, I suppose in George Payton's case. But at the same time, if the Broncos do finish with a winning record or in the playoffs or both that really makes the decision tough i mean how do you how do you cut you know cut bait with a guy who had you know really brutal he has a playoff day in his contract for this year yeah so. does he oh yeah exactly so then he needs to he needs if he if he does what they're telling him to do you know that would be kind of unfair for them to just up and fire him unless they have a clear upgrade that they see you know I, I feel like we can really get an upgrade here and we can't pass on it we have to move on even despite what was you know previously mandated or agreed to yeah that's going to be a really tough decision i would hate to be in that kind of seat of making those decisions just because at the end of the day, you know, yes, everything is business, but you do form personal relationships and friendships when you work together with people. And that's always a tough thing when you have to make a decision to let somebody go. But yeah, I mean, if the Broncos, for example, like I said, Benjamin Albright, Ryan Edwards on Broncos country tonight, multiple times have said, and have noted that Vic Fangio has a playoff mandate in his contract this year. It's playoffs or bust or else his job's on the line. So if the Broncos don't make the playoffs, more than likely Vic's gone. If they do make it, I think it does pose an interesting question. Do they do that? I think that they still make a change at OC regardless because the offense absolutely has to be better. And Sarah, as we talk about here, for I think for the sixth year in a row, is that the Broncos defense has been the best part of the team. So yeah. the offense has to be better. And with all the talent that they have, you need to find a way to do it. You can no longer wait to get there. Having a franchise quarterback will obviously help that, but I think they're going to change up at quarterback. I think they're going to change up at play caller as well, so something to monitor there. Uh, real quick, one other question here before we get to the second half action in the fourth quarter of today's episode of Lockdown Broncos. We've got another one coming in here with Junior G, and he says, I can't deny the fact that the trio, the wide receiver trio is solid with Jerry Judy, Tim Patrick, Cortland Sutton, but why haven't we given them more looks those guys only combine for 68 yards or so. What can the Broncos or what should they do to get those guys more looks in a game? And Sarah, I just wanted to say it's simple. Look, if the run game's working and you have a lead, keep running the ball. That's all I had to say. Look, I, I wanted to make the point here too, and, and I'll get into it a little bit deeper on once we come back here in just a second to talk about it. But when you have all these different guys, I guarantee you most of these players, the Broncos wide receivers, if the Broncos are winning games and they don't have as much like big production, big yards, you know, 12 catches or even like three touchdowns in a game, if they're winning games, I think that's what matters because the Broncos, what they've been doing, what the wide receivers have been doing over the last couple of years, they've been putting up big numbers, but the team has still been losing. I think that they would trade that for winning any time. I think anybody would. So it's really hard to say. We'll dive a little bit deeper that coming up here in just a moment, though, to answer your question in a second half follow up. But before we do that, let me tell you about the other sponsor of today's episode, Lockdown Broncos, our good friends over the they're at betonline.ag, and BetOnline has you covered all season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before as football season continues. It's March towards the playoffs, and BetOnline remains your number one spot for all sports action this season. So head to their new updated desktop or mobile website to sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit when you use promo code Locked on to receive that deposit bonus here today from basketball, football, NHL, boxing, UFC, and MMA action right to your favorite Vegas casino games. Don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers for the 2021 season. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your sports action. Bet online, where the game starts. 
And to follow up here in the fourth quarter on Junior's question, I, Sarah, talking about how these wide receivers could get more targets, I think a lot of clarity needs to be put out there regarding just the offensive line with where they're at, right? We, we praise them. The Broncos O-line has stepped up in a big way to get them to run the football the way that they did against the Chargers. No doubt about that. But a lot changes in the passing game in terms of what you want to do in terms of dialing up deep shots downfield. Keep in mind, footwork, drop backs, and those steps have a lot to do with the outcome of a play. So, for example, if you're going to throw a deep pass, more than likely it's going to be off play action, but it's going to be a deeper depth drop, or you're going to take a five-step drop because the five-step drop allows you to get depth. It allows guys to run downfield and allows you to try to hit them in stride. If there's a double move, it gives you more time. Three-step drops or one-step drops, one-stop hitches, usually those are quick passing to intermediate routes. And, and on, ideally, you want to be able to hit those ones quickly, right? So a three-step drop, one, two, three, set, fire, boom. That's what it is. Five-step drop, one, two, three, four, five, set, fire, look, either you know throw it deep or you hit the crossing guy in the middle of the field. That's usually what those kind of play designs really kind of scheme up for NFL offenses. So to provide clarity there on that. But Sarah, our other question here that I feel like this would be a great one for you to answer. What is the Chiefs' greatest weakness on defense, and how can Teddy Bridgewater, the Broncos' offense, exploit it? And that comes in from Paying Attention, 8 on Twitter. Boy, that's a, that's another really great question. I think over the whole of the season, right, it's kind of been their secondary, you know, which uh, you can kind of tell that based on the way they've constructed the roster. They haven't invested a ton in terms of draft capital at the cornerback position. They do have some guys out there. You know, DeAndre Baker is a former first-round pick. Obviously, Legereus Sneed has developed into a really good player. He's a stud. Uh, he's, yeah, he's, he's been a steal for them coming out of Louisiana Tech. He's been a really good player. Tyron Matthew and, and Juan Thornhill on the back end. You know, I think Dan Sorensen has been a guy that the Kansas City Chiefs fans, as I've been kind of watching from afar this season, they've really, he, they've really tabbed him as the weak link on that unit. So I suppose the more he plays, the better chance the Broncos have. But I think it has been that secondary. And then before the trade for, for Melvin Ingram, I feel like their defensive front wasn't playing up to snuff either. I, I think that that was a unit that was really struggling. They were trying Chris Jones off the edge at times, and that's just not his game. You know, he's definitely an interior player. And, and he's back in that role, and Ingram has provided a spark for them, and they're getting a better pass rush. Sounds like their, their pass rushers have really picked up steam in recent weeks as well, which I think is huge for them. You know, in terms of Steve Spagnuolo's defense, he likes to be aggressive. He likes to blitz, but those pass rushers still need to get home. I mean, we remember those great Giants defense he, defenses he used to coach, and, and it's key with those pass rushers getting home for being aggressive in the secondary. So I, I think that's been their main weakness this year. They haven't had consistent pass rush and it's led to some weakness on the back end where their roster isn't necessarily great. Yeah, you got to target Dirty Dan. Like Daniel Sorensen has been kind of the the go the scapegoat on Twitter so far this season. And any Chiefs game, any big explosive play happens, you see number forty nine in coverage. But you know Daniel Sorensen has had a fair share of really good games against the Broncos. So I don't want anybody, you know, Broncos says don't overlook that, right? I, I know that they have struggled, mm -hmm. but the last couple of weeks, the Chiefs defense they've started to play better, and it's because some of those changes that you did mention there, sir, with obviously moving Chris Jones back to the interior, Melvin Ingram on the outside there. They're getting guys more confident. Steve Spagnuolo is still keeping things aggressive, but they're still giving up plays, right? So the Broncos have to take advantage of different matchups. Start off with running the football. And as you mentioned, Sarah, last week against the Chargers and the, and the keys to game is set up the pass with the run. Same thing here. And obviously, we're going to break things down with the uh, with Chris Clark, obviously, of Locked on Chiefs a little bit later on this week. But I think that's a great question there, too. And I would even say, too, for the Chiefs offense, if I have to flip that question around, what is the biggest weakness on the Chiefs offense? You know, a lot of it, I think, has to be with just – Patrick Mahomes, when he does have a little bit more time, like if the coverage is good, for some reason this year, he's still done those crazy plays where he's got pressure in his face, he does that side rollout, he spins all the way back, he spins backside, he's running all the way to the sideline, he sidearms it, but it's either being intercepted or it's being tipped or it's just not falling complete the way that it used to, especially against a team like the Denver Broncos. So I, I don't know, I'm really excited this week to see a little bit of Jonathan Cooper in this game. Bradley Chubb obviously mm -hmm. ramping things up a little bit. I, this is going to be a tough matchup for the Broncos, and I, I really expect them to take a lot of uh, chances inside the slot in the nickel, especially at Kyle Fuller as he continues to learn the nickel position. I think they're going to try to line some guys up there and try to take advantage of some of those matchups. Will the Broncos run a lot of man in this game? I'm not sure. 
Vic Fangio, though, one thing we saw in last year, and you mentioned on yesterday's episode of the show as we had a little bit of an early preview there, is that Vic and this defense, they kind of gave out a little bit of the blueprint that other teams have copied. Now, for example, what we're talking about here is that the Tampa Bay Buccaneers copied the Vic Fangio, the Broncos' defensive game plan from that Sunday night football matchup that we saw last year. And they used that in the Super Bowl, and it worked out really great. And obviously their personnel had a big factor in it, but that was when their secondary, their secondary still was really weak. It wasn't as strong as I think the Broncos secondary currently is today. So can the Broncos secondary avoid some of those big plays? Because remember a couple of those third and long plays that they ended up getting? Denver's had a tendency this year so far, Sarah, to give up big plays on third and long, and they they can't do that against Kansas City. Kansas City is one of those teams, you make that mistake against them, good luck. You have to hope for a miracle that they mess up because then – uh, it's just hard. It's a snowball effect if they really get things going. So I think that's a really interesting way to look at it. And can special teams play well for a second consecutive week in a row? I think that's another big question. Yeah, it is. And can you get a spark from them even too? You know, like the Sam Martin punt that was down at the one yard line by Nate Harrison. That was a spark Huge. play for the Broncos. It was a big play. Deontay Spencer, can you provide a spark in the return game? We haven't really seen that from him this year. He's had a couple solid returns, Cody, but just, just hasn't been that. I mean, he returned one in, in the game against the chargers where he caught the ball around the 20 and barely made it to the 25, or it was, it was, you know, it was a weird return. It was a short kickoff, but man, I expect more out of Deontay Spencer. Yeah. So definitely a, a good week for the special teams as a whole, you know, the coverage units did a really good job, but still an opportunity there. If you're going to beat the Chiefs, I mean, you got to be on your game in all three phases, especially on special teams where the Broncos have kind of gotten just destroyed by Kansas City, whether we're talking about, you know, return touchdowns or what have you. So it has to be, it has to be on point. I, I'm not punting to uh, McCole Hardman or Robinson <laughs> back there. I'm not punting to any of those. I'm not, I'm not kicking it off to Pringle. And, you know, Pringle's played his way into the rotation as well. And I believe – I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but number one, he's a wide receiver. He can play running back. He's kind of the mm, hybrid yeah. athlete. I, I forgot his name for Kansas City, so I'm going to come back to it later on Jared this week. McKinnon. There we go, Jarek McKinnon. They have so many options here, Sarah. I'm – yeah. Makes you anxious, but then again, the Chargers had a lot of options as well, and I thought the Broncos had a really good game plan. If Baron Brown and Kenny Young can continue to stay healthy, and obviously the continuity on the back end of the secondary is still there, I, the Broncos, this might be the best chance for them to beat the Chiefs right now. So mm-hmm. why not? Why not do it in season? Because guess do what? It. You know what's on the line? First place in the AFC West, if that is the case. And then from that point forward, the Broncos control their destiny with matchups against the Bengals and the Detroit Lions. So, Sarah, you know what? I'm happy, my friend. I'm excited. I think that the the opportunities for this team are endless here in the second half of the season. But you got to take it week to week. And Broncos country can hear me say that the rest of the season. Let's take things week to week because that's all Sarah and I do. We take things day to day, week to week, but we're never looking too far ahead on everything. So thank you so much for tuning in to today's episode, Lockdown Broncos, which is available free and everywhere you get your podcasts. If you're not yet subscribed what are you waiting for click that subscribe button on whatever podcasting platform you listen to if you're watching us on youtube and you want to tune in you want to engage with us on the show we'll answer your comments we'll interact with you in the chat make sure you hit that subscribe button turn on notifications so you don't miss out on all the covers that sarah and i will bring you all year long covering the denver broncos from an objective point of view but with that said i'm cody work speaking for sarah bedger we'll see you tomorrow for a brand new episode locked on broncos